Today's speaker is Dr. Alice Kay. Dr. Kay is a consultant and scientific advisor at Sertara. Her research interests center around applying PBPK and PKPD modeling to predict complex drug interactions and PKPD in special populations. She obtained her doctorate in pharmaceutics from the University of Washington, Seattle, where her research focus was on assessing fetal and CNS drug distribution using clinical imaging techniques. She then accepted an ORISE fellowship in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology at the FDA, where she developed and validated PVPK and population PK models to support dose adjustment for pregnant women. After completing her fellowship, Dr. Kay was a research scientist in the Department of Drug Disposition and PKPD at Lilly Research Labs, where she applied population PK and PVPK modeling and simulation techniques to advise the design of clinical pharmacology studies. Alice, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to her to begin the presentation. Thank you, Susanna, for a nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be given the opportunity to share the Satara approach or experience with regard to leveraging PBPK simulation for neonatal and infant drug development. So I will begin my presentation by brief reviewing, briefly reviewing the regulatory perspective on the use of modeling and simulation to support pediatric drug development. I will then provide an introduction on how the development and maturation of organs affect drug pharmacokinetics in these pediatric populations. I will then introduce recent advances in the PBPK field as its application to drug development in this population. And then the last part of my presentation We'll be focusing on several real-life case studies using PBPK to guide or support drug development in this population. Even though there have been regulatory changes aiming to incentivize pediatric drug development, it is understandable that due to ethical, economical, and practical concerns, it's still a big challenge to develop drugs just for this population. And it's well recognized that children are not more adults. Here is a brief summary of uh, the commonly used terms to describe the different uh, age brackets within this population. So we have neonates that refers to birth after one month, infants refers to one month after two years, and children refers to two years to up to 12 years. And then for adolescent group, it's 12 years above. And over the years, people have come to this consensus that when we deal with scaling drug, uh, drug kinetics in the pediatric, pediatric population, for ages up to six, greater than six years old, allometric scaling has been successfully used to scale PK. However, for children under the age of two, due to the heter uh, heterogeneity of this population, allometric scaling has not been that successful for this particular age range. And this is due to the different uh, oncogenic maturation of organ development, drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters, plasma protein binding differences, et cetera. And in particular, the neonate population, they are the least studied and they're the most fragile population. And if you look at within this neonatal population, there's in fact a one log size differences in body weight, ranging from 0 0.5 to 5 kilograms between the extremely low birth weight preterm infant and full term infant. And there is a widespread use of off-label drug, uh, prescription drug use in this population, which then results in either underdosing, overdosing, um, and adverse drug effects. And it's not uh, surprising that less than 5% of the pediatric trials include neonates in the clinical studies. 
Now, to address this urgent medical need, both the U.S. FDA and EMA now require pediatric trial plan, the pediatric study plan, PSP, and the pediatric investigational plan, PIP, respectively, as part of the approval process for new drugs. And these are some of the, the specific language that's used in the FDA 2014 guidance for the clinical pharmacology considerations for pediatric studies, for drugs and biologics, uh, this guidance for the uh, industry. And you can see that uh, throughout the guidance, it is highly encouraged that modeling and simulation using all the information available should be an integral part of the uh, drug development program. And it's recognized that modeling and simulation can provide a method for reducing uncertainty about drug dosing in specific pediatric population. And specifically, when you look at how PBPK has been used in pediatric drug development, here is a list of the uh, specific indications. These include planning for the first in pediatric PK study, optimizing study design, verifying the model in specific age groups, recommending a starting dose, informing enzyme ontogeny using a benchmark drug, and lastly, facilitating covariate analysis. Now, if you look at the most recent uh, position paper from EMA, uh, what you will notice is that this paper proposed a framework that aims to provide the basis for an explicit and systematic approach to extrapolation, not only for the efficacy data, but also for safety data in pediatric drug development programs. Again, you will see that it's recommended to integrate all available data, including in vitro, preclinical, and clinical, in an appropriate platform to investigate or predict the dose exposure relationship and also uh, uh, target engagement relationship. And these kind of integration approach can also be used to scale PK with age, and specifically, PDPK approach is mentioned. Uh, alternatively, you can use semi-magnetic population models to account for not only body size, but also maturation of organs, drug ontogeny, uh, ontogeny functions for drug metabolizing enzymes, and appropriate covariates. And it's highly recommended to use modeling approach to optimize PKPD studies in children. And again, PDPK models are encouraged. Now, I'd like to share with you this very nice review article from the uh, FDA uh, Pediatric Clean Farm Group, where they have surveyed the FDA database and identified 43 drugs that have been studied in neonates uh, between the duration of from 1998 to 2014. And out of these 43 drugs that's being studied, 20 drugs were approved. And you can see from this table what is the uh, uh, approval based on some of the drugs. The approval was based on efficacy data in neonates. Some of the approval were based on full extrapolation from older patients. And for some of the drugs, it's based on partial extra extrapolation. More importantly, this review article identified some of the reasons for trial failures. These include lack of efficacy and, for some drugs, safety issues. And very interestingly, underdosing was identified as a contributing factor to trial failure in 10 instances. Now, if you look at this um, very nice uh, figure illustrating four different drugs, how the body size adjusted drug clearance change as a function of age. 
you will notice that first, this patent seems to be drug dependent. And you will also notice that for some of the drugs, you see this initial increase in drug clearance that's being adjusted by body size. And shown here is uh, adjusted by body weight. So you see this initial increase, but then followed by this decline for three of the drugs shown here. So really, uh, what I, the point I want to make on this slide is that if, if adjusted adjustment, but, uh, adjustment based on body size is sufficient, then what we would expect is a flat line, but clearly it's not the case here. This really highlights the importance of not only adjust for body size, but also to account for ontogenous functions that are responsible for the uh, specific clearance mechanism of each of these drugs. Now this brings us to this particular platform, so-called PBPK. So why is it um, attractive? It's because this particular platform allows us to separate system data from drug data. And shown here on the slide is what we mean by system data versus drug data. So in this case, you will see that the demographic information, the tissue volume, tissue composition, cardiac output, renal function, plasma protein, enzyme ontogeny, these are considered as a system data. And then for drug data, these include physical properties, in vitro metabolism data, permeability, and transport data if transport is involved, and lastly, formulation data. So the PDPK approach really allows us to then integrate system data and drug data using a particular trial design. And this allows us to further assess drug clearance in various populations and to ultimately to allow us to predict drug PK and PD in the target population. And this figure shows you what a generic PDPK model looks like. And shown here is a full PDPK model, which means that we do have a compartment representing a key organ or tissue. And you will see that um, the really the advantage of PDPK approach, or the reason that PDPK approach has been successful, is that it allows us to integrate this ID IDE approach, meaning that we were able we, we can scale on uh, clearance from enzyme kinetic data that are generated in vitro. And then by applying a series of scaling factors, we can up, 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 obtain a uh, drug clearance for the whole organ. Shown here is how we scale drug clearance in the liver. And then combined with a structural model for PVPK uh, to describe the whole body, this then allow us to simulate a concentration time profile. And this graph, although it looks complicated, uh, it really shows, really gives you a visual image of how the complexity of covariate effects are integrated into the uh, system data. So here I would like to draw your attention on age and how age is linked to various um, system parameters. And to make this process easier, so now if you focus on the color arrows and follow my pointer, you can see that Within the sense of PPPK platform, height is in fact defined as a function of age, and then weight is defined as a function of height. And then from height and weight, body surface area is calculated. And then from body surface area, liver volume, heart volume are then defined as a fraction of body surface area or function of body surface area. 
you can see that uh, cardiac output is also linked to body surface area. So the reason I'm highlighting all these key uh, covariates is because these are then linked to uh, drug clearance and also drug distribution. And this is how, by simply accounting for the age distribution in a given population, you then introduce these uh, covariate effects in the system data. And this is what it looks like when we look at liver volume. So this is the equation that's used to define liver volume as a function of body surface area. And if you recall from the previous slide how body surface area is then linked to age, you can then generate this nice relationship between liver volume and age. And what's shown here in gray are the simulated uh, virtual relationship between liver volume and age in gray diamond. And then the black squares are observed data. You can see there's a very nice correlation between the simulated and observed uh, relationship between liver volume and uh, age. And um, similarly, the uh, PBK model can also account for liver blood flow as a function of age. And this is because we account for the cardiac output and how it changes as a function of age, as, previous, uh, as described on the previous slide. So now we have just reviewed how we count for liver size and uh, liver blood flow, which then um, influence drug clearance in a younger age group. Now we, we're looking at an alternatively elimination mechanism, which is renal clearance. And there are actually uh, um, a big data set that exists within the literature that allowed us to generate this nice relationship between uh, this renal function marker, which is glomerular filtration rate, as a function of uh, body size, body surface area. And this is the relationship that SNSIP uses, and it's been published uh, almost 10 years ago by Trevor Johnson. And over the years, you've seen other independent uh, studies reporting a renal function maturation uh, pattern. And if you look at the comparison of the SNSIP approach, which is this Johnson 2006 paper, in, relation, in relationship to these other literature models, what you will see is, uh, in fact, we don't see a big discrepancy between these various approaches. So the key area that since the team spent tremendous effort on over the years is to develop and refine these enzyme ontogeny functions. So shown here is uh, the data that I used to derive an ontogeny function for CYP34, which uh, is one of the most important CYP enzymes responsible for elimination of many drugs on the market. So what you see here is a summary of medazolam IV clearance data. These are um, the observed IV data uh, generated in, uh, actually they're extracted from this particular paper, uh, which looked at, included uh, population from preterm neonates to adults. And because of this population is not necessarily a healthy population, uh, the, we then have to correct for disease effects and ventilation effect, and then deconvolute what the intrinsic citrus for activity should be from this medazolam IV clearance. So the size of the dot represents the uh, number of subjects in that particular age group. So what you will see here is um, that there is a very rapid maturation of CYP34 enzyme, particularly over the first two years of age. So you can also see that uh, same data plotted differently uh, in this bottom graph, bottom graph represented by this uh, blue line. So you can see that by up to two years old, the CYP34 activity 
approach the adult level. So what you want also notice that there's a red line representing the uh, cytoform cogeny that's derived from in vitro data. Uh, without going into the details, um, this reflects the uh, approach that we've been, uh, we have evolved to is that we're leaning more towards using in vivo data to derive enzyme autogeny. Um, that is because with the in vitro autonomy data, sometimes there are methodology issues either relating to how the uh, uh, samples were prepped or um, the underlying uh, disease factors related to uh, the, the subject, study subjects from which the uh, tissues were collected. So because of these methodology issues, we have evolved into uh, relying on in vivo data to generate enzyme metagenes. So that's what we have been using in the past few years. Now, if you look at for another SIP enzyme, this is SIP1A2, so similarly, we have relied on these probe substrates. Shown here are caffeine and C alkaline. So we have used the ID clues to derive an autogenous function for SIP1A2. And interestingly, what you will see if you look at this blue line, is that you will notice for this enzyme, the enzyme activity is more robust during the first uh, five years of life, and then it declines back to adult level. So this is a very interesting observation, and um, it shows that for the autonomous function for SIP enzymes, they're actually very much isoform dependent. We can not just assume that the for the neonatal children, the enzyme function or activity is always lower than that in adults. And once we derive these ontogenous functions for various SIP isoforms, it is very important for us to then verify these ontogeny using independent data set. Shown here are the independent data ver uh, verification performed for CYP1, uh, CYP3A using alfentanil as the validating drug and using uh, the pivacan for CYP1A2 validation. So what you see here is the observed data represented by these gray bars, um, the predicted clearance represented by um, these um, gray hatched bars. You will see is that there is a good accordance between the observed and predicted clearance across various age ranges. So similar data or similar inde uh, independent verification exercise have been performed by other groups such as Amagen or AstraZeneca. And by and large, uh, these independent verification um, suggested that the uh, for, for, for these key SIP enzymes, such as 1A2 or SIP3A4, we do have a, a high level of confidence in these derived ontogen um, functions, and they have been successfully used to predict drug clearance. So when it comes to pre predicting drug PK in this particular population, not only we need to consider drug clearance, and drug distribution as a function of age, we also need to consider how the absorption of drugs can be different in this population. And to this end, uh, within the past three years, since the team has developed these, uh, this very sophisticated pediatric absorption model that accounts, accounts for various uh, age effects that can affect these various GI uh, functions. For example, gastric empty time, gastric fluid volume, gastric pH, intestinal citrate full activity, et cetera. So here, I just want to highlight one physiological changes that we systematically reviewed and integrated into the synthetic simulator. This is looking at gastric empty time and there used to be this notion that gastric empty uh, should be delayed in the neonates and infants. 
But it turns out, based on our, our analysis, it is not the case. So this is a meta-analysis performed by the Sensor team uh, using Nelman approach uh, to look at covariate effects and how this covariate effect uh, changes gastric empty. And it turns out that age is actually not a covariate affecting gastric empty time. It is, in fact, the food type. So the solid feed prolonged gastric empty as compared to a liquid feed. So this information is now uh, in, in, incorporated in the sensitive simulator. Now, just to give you an example for how we use the pediatric absorption module to predict how these pediatric specific formulations perform in the pediatric formulation, here I would like to introduce this published example on ketiapine. So this is an antipsychotic drug, and immediate release formulation has been studied in adults and, and is approved in adults. The immediate release formulation has also been studied in the pediatric uh, patients. So since then, the company decided to develop an extended release formulation uh, for practical considerations, that is to, to reduce the dosing frequency. And uh, the goal here is to, to ask the question, can we use PBPK approach to predict the exposure of this new formulation, which is the extended release formulation, in the pediatric patient? And this workflow shows the, how the model development and validation was executed. And you will see that the model development starts with developing a model for the immediate release formulation based on healthy adult data. And then to bridge the difference between the healthy and patient data for the same formulation. Once this is achieved, this model is then applied to the pediatric patient for the same formulation. And you will see that the simulated concentration time profile shown here are the median and the 95% uh, percent confidence, uh, percentile of the concentration. Um, and the symbols represent the observed data. You can see that the majority of the observed data are contained within the 95 um, percentile. And once this model has been verified with the pediatric data, the next step is then to bridge the formulation difference. So in this case, um, a separate model that captures the absorption kinetics for the extended release formulation was then constructed based on the adult data. Again, you will see that the developed model for this formulation um, successfully recovers the observed data. And then the next step, the final step, is then to apply the developed model for this new formulation in various age groups of the pediatric population. And this is the final result for the model application. Uh, which is to predict exposure uh, following both extended release and immediate release formulation. And in this case, the particular age range the company uh, was interested in is uh, children and adolescents. What you will see, both on, based on both the overlay of profile as well as the TK parameter comparison, is that these two formulations are uh, bioequivalent. And in this case, uh, because the age range uh, they're interested in are, uh, is for children that are um, at least 10 years old, and this perhaps explains why in this case we did not predict or anticipate a big differences between these two formulations. But you can imagine that if we're dealing with a much younger population, then the age effect on various GI physiology will have a much bigger impact for um, these pediatric formulations and how the absorption can differ in this uh, younger population. 
So starting from uh, three years ago, the census team has continued to uh, expand uh, the GDCT model. And one particular population that we looked at is the preterm infants, uh, neonates. So the starting point was to collect system data from uh, published literature, a database or publication. So these are all the system data that we considered. Highlighted in red are covariates that we do have a lot of information on. Show in black are, in fact, um, covariates or uh, system data that we don't have a lot of information. Therefore, we had to borrow from the existing model for the full-term neonates population. So here are just some examples. For example, for body weight, uh, there is sufficient data for us to construct this uh, percentile of body weight as a function of gestational age. And then similarly, for renal function, uh, we also have sufficient data to describe the maturation of renal function um, in various uh, age groups. So you will notice that the youngest uh, preterm neonate data that we have is from the 24 weeks old. And that refers to the gestational age. Now, just to look at one example of how we can apply this preterm neonate model to uh, predict drug clearance. Here we're looking at viability, which is a uh, HIV, uh, one of the common uh, drugs used for treat uh, HIV conditions. And in this case, the reason that we have a lot of neonate uh, clinical data from the neonate is because uh, this is commonly used as a prevention measure to prevent um, the transfer of virus across the placenta. Um, to, uh, from the mother to the child. So because we had a rich clinical data set, we were then able to then use this dilutive data to then assess how ugt 2 b 7 activity change as a function of gestational age. Um, this is because ugt 2 b 7 is one of the major enzymes that metabolize this drug. So there are various ways to uh, look at this data. Um, without going to the details, um, if we just look at the figure on the top, uh, what we're trying to illustrate here is uh, if you uh, look at on um, day one, um, this is referring to the ugt 2 b 7 activity uh, as a fraction of adult level. So if you look at day one, um, there really uh, isn't a significant difference between the preterm versus the full-term neonates. But then over the course of 28 days, you, you start to see how the maturation assumptions start to differ between these uh, different um, preterm neonate groups. So the bottom uh, figure is trying to really illustrate a similar, very similar idea. So before I start to introduce case examples related to PPK application to support PDS drug development, I would like to first uh, show you this uh, statistics from the uh, uh, Office of Clinical Pharmacology uh, at FDA. So based on their statistics, they have seen a they have seen this trend where pediatric applications represent a very significant portion of PPK submissions that FDA received up to 2014. And you will see that, yes, drug interaction remains to be the main uh, application for PPK approaches, but also there's a significant portion, roughly 17% of the submissions are related to pediatric applications. And because of the increasing application or utilization of PPK, PPK approach to support pediatric drug development, um, we start to see this 
best practice approach being, a, being proposed both by regulatory bodies but also by um, uh, various academic groups. And what you will see is that this learn and a confirm approach has been approached, uh, proposed by various groups. And it's very important that the model that's developed based on adult data needs to be further verified in terms of the relative contribution of each enzyme. And to verify the contribution of each enzyme, typically the uh, drug interaction data that are uh, generated in adults are utilized for this purpose. And once this model has been verified with regard to the contribution of each enzyme, then this model can be applied to predict exposure in various age ranges in the pediatric group. So here, um, I'm using a drug that's called buprenorphine as an example to illustrate this workflow. So buprenorphine, as you may know, is used to treat this neonatal abstinence uh, syndrome. Um, and that is referring to uh, neonates exhibiting those uh, withdrawal symptoms uh, that's uh, due to uh, the mother's dependence on op opioids. So buprenorphine is metabolized by UGT1A1 and CYP34. So to develop this model, um, it is very important that we first verify that the model has a robust data that allow us to uh, assign the relative contribution between these two pathways. And then you can see that once you verify the relative contribution by these two different pathways, these ontogeny functions are then applied to ultimately predict the exposure in the pediatric population. And you will see that the ontogeny function for these two enzymes are actually very different. And that is why it is important for us to construct a robust model where the relative contributions of enzymes are verified with usually uh, drug interaction data obtained in adults. So although this is um, an example that's illustrated for buprenorphine, the same workflow has been applied uh, both within Sunset and also by others to, um, as it comes to uh, predicting the first in pediatric PK uh, profile. So not surprisingly, when you look at published examples within the literature, you will see that uh, the pediatric oncology um, drug development has received a lot of attention because, as you know, this is a very rare or we can call it ultra-rare disease. And so the patient pool is very small, so that's why PVPK approach has been viewed as a very attractive tool to really um, maximize the learning from adult data and then um, to optimize the study design before the conduct of the first pediatric study. So this is a very nice review article that focused on PVPK application in the pediatric oncology drug development programs. And you will see that for a big portion of the drugs, the PVPK simulations were performed prior to the first time in pediatric uh, studies. And that's because um, at that time, um, significant efforts were uh, spent on really validating this approach. And it's also encouraging to see that we are beginning to see more and more PVPK simulations that are performed prior to the first in pediatric clinical trial. And in fact, um, PBK approach or exercise has been conducted to select the dose and also to inform the study design uh, before the execution of the clinical trial. 
And then from this review paper, um, this, is, this is what they have identified, uh, which is a lot of the application was used to retro, uh, retrospectively validate an approach, or they have been used to, for submission package to support the PIP plan, and uh, most common widely used is to select a dose for the first in pediatric studies. So now I'm going to uh, introduce the first case study. This is actually from the same review paper. So this is a um, PUPK modeling uh, project that CINSIP uh, performed um, for this company based in uh, Cambridge, um, which is called Epizon. So they uh, specialize in, in these development of oncolytics to uh, treat this really rare uh, cancer disease in the pediatric population. So in this case, PPK simulations have been used to select the dose and also to inform or to optimize the sampling point. And once the model had been verified, not only with adult data but also with pediatric data, the PPK model has been subsequently used to address additional clean fund questions, including drug interaction and PKPD analysis. And this example that I'm presenting uh, is uh, published, so the reference is listed here. If you are interested in the details of model development and verification, um, I highly recommend that you uh, review this paper uh, on your own time. So here, I just want to briefly walk you through the workflow for model development applications for this molecule. So first step for adult model development, this is using, comparing the PVK model simulated concentration time profiles of pedostat following, in this case, a continuous IV administration in the adult patient at the highest dose level, which is 90 milligrams per uh, square meter per day. And the solid gray line, a solid black line represents the simulated mean, and the dash line represents the 95 percentile of the simulated concentration. And the symbols represent the observed data points. You can see that for this dose level, most of the observed concentrations are contained within the simulated uh, percentile, the 95 uh, percentile. And the same adult model has been verified against adult data obtained at other dose levels. And then, uh, furthermore, the model predicted steady state concentration were then compared against the observed and it was concluded that adult model predicted steady state concentration were within twofold of the observed. And what's not shown here is that the model has been verified against uh, available drug interaction data to verify the contribution of enzymes, in this case, a CYP34 enzyme. As I mentioned, this is an important part of the model verification workflow. And then the model was applied to predict pediatric doses. So these are the predict predicted uh, clearance. Uh, as you can see, that there is about a two-fold range um, within this particular age range they're interested in. So from the youngest age range is one to three months, and then the oldest age group they're interested in is up to 18 years old. So then based on a fixed body surface area normalized dose, these are the predicted start, starting dose based on the PPK simulation. So essentially, reduce the dose by almost half for infants. And then for children greater than six years old, the same adult dose was proposed. And these PPK predicted doses were further simplified due to practical considerations. So the final dose they actually used in the clinical trial was for the youngest age group, they have used 80% uh, of the adult dose. 
and then, uh, sorry, 50% 50, 50 of the adult dose. And then for patients that are greater than one year old, the starting dose use was 80%. And the clinical study in the pediatric patients were performed based on the dose uh, projected based on PDPK, uh, as illustrated on the previous slide. And this is a summary of how the model performs when it's compared against the pediatric data. So what we're looking here is the steady state concentration stratified by age, uh, sorry, by, yes, by age and then by dose. So if you look at these two higher dose levels, 17 milligram and 90 milligram, and there is a reasonable number of patient data for us to compare against. And um, what's shown here is the box plot uh, represents the observed data, and then the stash line represents the observed median concentration in adults. And then the gray area represents the predicted concentration using the PCK approach. And you can see that for these two higher dose levels, there is a, a good agreement between the predicted and observed steady state concentration. You will also notice for that uh, in this youngest age group, and unfortunately there's only one patient data for us to compare. And it seems to suggest that in this younger age group, uh, there seems to be an overprediction of concentration, um, but we cannot really draw a solid conclusion because it's based on only one subject. But by and large, you will see that um, the PUTK model informed uh, uh, predicted concentrations are in very good agreement with the obtained data from the pediatric patients. And this is just another way of looking at the data by overlaying the concentration time profiles. These lines represent the simulated concentrations in various age groups. And the data points um, actually combine from this very range age group. The youngest age group is six months up to 18 years. So you will see that it seems there there seems to be a slight underprediction of the uh, concentration, um, although the predictions are still contained within two folds of the observed data points. So now I'd like to move on to the second case example. In this case, we're looking at a drug um, that's developed as a first in class uh, agent to reduce heart rate. And these are the therapeutic doses that's used in adults at three different dose levels. And the company decided to perform a study in a pediatric patient with this particular heart condition. And this is to be uh, compliant with the uh, uh, pediatric European regulation. And they have decided to assess drug efficacy and safety in children over one year old. And they have developed a liquid oral formulation for younger patients, and they have performed bioequivalent tests to establish the bioequivalency in healthy volunteers. And the main objective of model PZBK modeling was to select the dose, starting dose, to evaluate the pediatric formulation and to optimize the sampling design and sampling technique. And I will explain later uh, what we mean by sampling technique. So in this case, the drug is, uh, has an active metabolite. So PZK modeling was employed to simulate not only the parent drug, but also the active metabolite. So these are the particular age ranges uh, the company was interested in, and that's based on the uh, reported uh, demographic or known uh, disease effects within these age brackets. So what they try to do is 
they selected this dose 0 0.1 mg per kilogram BID dosing that's scaled by allometry, and then using the same dose and then simulated the steady state exposure of the drug in three different age groups. And you will see that if you apply the same dose, the youngest age group, which is represented here for the 6 to 12 months, they will get overexposure to the drug. And so based on these simulated exposures, they then further reduce the drug in order to match the steady state exposure in the dose. So you will see that the dose was reduced accordingly in these age groups. So the youngest group gets the lowest dose. And then they also used PVK simulation to uh, select sampling points. So in this clinical study, they have utilized this dry blood, uh, dry blood spot sampling technique, which is more and more commonly used, particularly for the pediatric population. So they were interested in where to place the uh, blood sampling point. So I would like to draw your attention on just the red solid line. That is actually the simulated concentration using PDPK approach. And then the red vertical area uh, represent the simulated percentiles of the uh, using the PDPK approach. So based on these profiles, they then decided to have one PK sampling at the early time point, two PK samples around the inflection, then two PK samples during the elimination phase. And then they also uh, utilize this PPK approach to assess whether different sampling techniques may impact the PK uh, measurement. So in this case, they have uh, investigated whether sampling at a finger or sampling by a uh, many puncture have any impact on um, um, measured drug concentration. So these are the various kind of questions that can be investigated using PVK approach. And then very encouraging to us is that later on they did perform the trial using the pro pro projected dose informed by PVPK, and then these symbols represent the observed data, and you will see that in all eight groups, the simulated concentration time profiles are in very nice agreement with the observed data. So, so far I've introduced two different case examples. One on um, applying the PV approach to select uh, pediatric doses, and the second example more focusing on how PVK approach can be used, utilized to optimize study design. And this is uh, Another important consideration of study design is to select the sample size. Um, highlighted here is a uh, study that Susip con conducted, which is to utilize uh, PVK simulation to assess sample size. And here, uh, several sources of PK variability was investigated. So in this case, you can use the PK variability that's simulated from a few PK model. You can use the observed PK variability from adult PK data or from pediatric PK data. And this allows you to look at whether you see differences in the sample size calculated according to the stop, uh, source of variability. So this is a very nice uh, study, and I would highly encourage you to um, read on your own time if this is of interest to you. So the majority of my presentation is really focusing on scale, how to scale PK as a function of age. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot ignore also known differences in PD effects in the pediatric population. So here I just want to highlight one example. What, are, what we're looking at here is the develop, developmental differences in these L-type calcium channels um, as assessed using human uh, arterial myocytes in response to this isoprotenol treatment. What you will see is this response of 
dose response curve obtained at different, uh, three different age groups. And what you will notice is that there's actually a dramatic, dramatic difference in the EC50 value. And what this can imply is that we would expect that in the neonatal group, the therapeutic window can be narrower, which means that the neonate population might be successful or more successful to uh, cardiac uh, risks. So these are you no know, uh, PD differences that are documented in literature, and this is actually one area we're trying to expand or to further apply to the UK model is to combine the PDK model with a PD endpoint and to account for these PD differences to further uh, allow us to inform the uh, dose to be used in the pediatric population. So to conclude my talk, I have shown you uh, the various examples that a PDDK model has become part of a package of modeling simulation to be used to support drug development in the pediatric population. Uh, we've seen that the application of these models has been used uh, in both preclinical and clinical drug development, and uh, it, it has a unique advantage, particularly for children under two years old. And although it's not covered in this presentation, but we can envision that even for patients that are young, older than two years, these PBK models, once verified, can still be applied for various applications, including drug interaction evaluation uh, to assess complexity in uh, PK behaviors and, and also to bridge formulation differences. And we recognize that these PVK models for the pediatric population are still evolving, and some of the system data are known unknowns. So this really calls for a collaborative effort between academia, industry, and regulators in establishing best practice in the application of this approach. So with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation, and I. I'm ready to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alice, for the uh, very informative presentation. Uh, we have a, looks like we have a couple questions from our audience. Um, first question from our audience related to um, your slide on CYP3A4 ontogeny, and someone wanted to know what the relative expression levels were. Just want to make sure I understand your question. The question was about what it means by relative expression, or yeah, we'll, we'll have to ask the um, the person who quote posed that question to, to clarify, um, and we'll we'll go back to that. Um, someone also wanted to know if you've come across um, such examples for transporter ontogeny, and more specifically OATP1B. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we have been collating information on uh, drug transporters. So these include HEPAS transporters, OATP 1B1, 1B3, PGP, and also renal transporters. So with transporters, it, it is uh, a little bit tricky in that it depends on the uh, measurement endpoint. Uh, we don't always see a good relationship correlation between mRNA versus activity data, and this is not an issue for enzymes. So because of this um, disagreement between the different endpoints, um, it, it is not always clear. So take OHB1B1 as an example. Uh, if you look at uh, activity data versus mRNA data, one is showing there's not a significant maturation pattern whereas the other one is showing there's a decrease in activity. So because of this disagreement in literature data, what we have decided to do is to create a generic function within the simulator, which means that as a user, you can define your uh, a user function, user-defined function, 
and then to assess how this can um, recover the PK of drugs that are that has a significant uh, component contributed by OATP one B one. So this is um, one way to use the PK approach, which is to to learn about system data from drug data. I hope I've answered that question. Um, looks like we have another question from our audience. Someone would like to know how many times, many times we assume similar PKPD relationship in neonates and infants as in adults. How can we verify this information when we propose the dose in such patients? Well, if you look at the, uh, in particular, the guidance from EMA, so let me just go to that slide. Uh, if you read this reflection paper, it seems that, um, yes, you're correct, that in many cases we assume a similar PKPD relationship in neonates and infants, but then um, ultim ultimately, a study that to uh, a study has to be confirmed with the inclusion of either efficacy endpoint or safety endpoint to verify this assumption. Okay, it looks like we have one more um, question from the audience. Is there any plan to develop a lactation model for the SimSip simulator to predict drug transfer to infants via breast milk? Yeah, that's another very great question. So in response to a recent FDA position paper on updating drug labels for the pregnant population and lactating women, uh, we, within the SIMSA team, we have started to look at developing a lactating uh, model um, as a research project. So hopefully uh, the, the, the end goal is that we will be able to predict drug transfer from uh, breast milk to the infants. Um, so we have seen actually in the literature that various academic groups have made significant efforts. So we're, we're also trying to make uh, advancement, advancement in this particular area as, as there is an unmet, unmet medical need to be able to assess or to anticipate the extent of drug transfer via this route. Okay, it looks like we have a few more questions. Um, someone would, would like to know what you think is the best way to learn a PB, PBPK modeling from a clinical pharmacologist. Well, best way to learn a PBPK model is by developing a model yourself. Um, so, uh, I would highly encourage you to uh, attend a sensitive workshop. Uh, in particular, we have this focus workshop on the pediatric PVK simulator, and we actually encourage you to bring your own data set. Um, and we can try to develop a model within the workshop and starting from um, developing the model based on adult data and then verified model um, with drug interaction data and then the plant model in the pediatric population. So in my view that the best way to learn this to is through using the PVG model. Uh, looks like we've got one final question. Um, someone would like to know what is the application of these PEBPK models in neonatal clinical rounds? Um, can, can you elaborate what you mean by clinical uh, neonatal rounds? Do you mean in a uh, in practice, how do you apply these models? Yeah, um, I think I think that's what they mean, like in, in a hospital setting. Yeah, that that is actually a, 
a direction we're trying to move into, but we're not there yet. Um, so you may be aware that since it has this iPhone app, uh, that's basically a static calculator that allow you to calculate in real time what is the DDI liability. So I guess to extend that idea, we can also try to develop a more user-friendly app that you can use um, in clinical practice. That is, that, that means that we have to use a simple app simplified platform uh, that requires fewer endpoints that you need to input, for example, demographic information or particular disease, and then that should be able to give you a readout. So this is a very good idea, but we're not there yet. Uh, we, we, we have just started, and we have a product for drug interaction assessment. Um, but maybe in the future we'll have a similar app for the neonates. 